This video is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. Stick around to find out more about creating your own website, online store, and much more. So, I know some of you saw the thumbnail and title of this video and went, What? What the f- So, just to clarify my own opinions on the latest season of Doctor Who, I thought it was a complete mess. In some ways, it was a big improvement over the previous two seasons, but many of the problems which existed previously have not only remained, but actually gotten worse. In a previous video of mine, I suggested a way for current Doctor Who to be improved would be to make it fully serialised. Chris Chibnall seemed to have a problem with overstuffing his episodes with too many characters and sci-fi concepts, which struggled for room to be fully explored. This often led to contrived plot resolutions and one-off supporting characters getting all the development while our main companions fell by the wayside. Which is why I believe the show becoming fully serialised would give much more room for everything to breathe. Episodes would be able to fully explore concepts leading to better plotting, and we'd have more room to properly develop the main characters. That's why I was excited to hear about a six-parter on the horizon. But rather than a serialised story giving the show more room to breathe, instead it just became even more overstuffed with characters who distracted from the main companions, sci-fi concepts which were utterly confusing and nonsensical, and plotting which felt even more messy and contrived. Now, as always, if you're a fan of this era of the show, I'm not here to tell you that your opinions are wrong or anything like that. I think it's awesome there are a lot of fans who love this era, and I really do wish I could enjoy it as much as they do. If you liked Doctor Who Flocks, this video is not here to try and shame or insult you, it's just my opinion, which I hope I can convey in a way that's at least interesting and entertaining. So what's with the title and thumbnail of this video? Well, because, as I said, Flux was by no means a total loss. There was a genuinely brilliant story idea in this series. One which, if it was given the room it needed, would have paid off many of Chibnall's long-running plot and character threads in a truly terrific and satisfying way. This video is here to explore what that story was, and how the existing problems within the series crippled its potential. This video is here to explore why this aspect of the series was almost brilliant. But first, ad time. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. As someone whose livelihood is primarily on YouTube, I know it's always a wise policy to carve out your own space online with a website, store, or portfolio of work. Squarespace is ideal if you want to create a website quickly and easily. No coding needed, simply select a pre-built, fully customizable template, and then adjust it to your own style and layout using easy-to-use drag-and-drop tools, or build one from scratch if that's more your thing. Either way, you'll be able to have your own website up and running in no time. For my own site, obviously I make a lot of videos, which is why Squarespace's portfolios, galleries, and video block features are ideal for the kind of site I want to create. Squarespace also allows you to create each website with a custom protected domain name, which can help your website reach the right audience. For example, by using a specific domain name like .art. All this and more is available for you to check out by clicking the link in the description. Head over to squarespace.com forward slash Rowan J. Coleman and use the promo code Rowan J. Coleman for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, back to the video. As a quick recap, Chris Chibnall's shall we say, controversial additions to Doctor Who canon, can be basically summarised as the Doctor discovering they had previous incarnations they didn't know about. And from what we can glean, these incarnations worked for the mysterious Division. Now let's put aside the extra paragraph this twist added to the Doctor Who wiki, and examine it from a story-slash-character perspective. What purpose was this supposed to serve? Or rather, what purpose was it meant to serve? I believe what this was meant to do was call into question the Doctor's character not from a timeline point of view, but more from a moral point of view. The Doctor often prides themselves on being morally right, fighting evil, defending the downtrodden, simple kindness, etc. But this hidden past in which the Doctor worked for a nefarious organisation out for universal domination clashes with this. It's supposed to make the Doctor wonder if they are truly as good as they thought they were, if they have the capacity to do the harmful acts they committed in these older incarnations, and if ultimately they've done far more harm to the universe than good. That's what I believe the intention was with this twist. However, here it already has a few problems. The only incarnation we really got to know all that much was the Ruth incarnation, and while she's certainly a little grittier, throwing down with a jadoon and waving a rifle around, 
She doesn't do anything we haven't seen John Pertwee or Peter Capaldi do. So the idea of the 13th Doctor not knowing who she thought she was doesn't really land, because the forgotten incarnation we see does exactly the kinds of things we expect from the Doctor. As I said when I originally reviewed this twist, rather than a huge character-shaking revelation, this twist feels like it boils down to the Doctor having extra incarnations they didn't previously know about, which just doesn't seem like much of a big deal. Coupled with this era's problem of a lack of character development for the companions, and we don't get a sense of the Doctor really being deeply troubled by all of this. We get glimpses of it, but every time it comes up it's more like, Oh yeah, that's a thing. So if Doctor Who Flux sought to pay all of this off, it's not impossible, but it's certainly building a climax on some shaky ground. That being said, I think Flux kicked things off quite well. It's all set up, of course, in this first episode, but the threat from the Flux itself is crystal clear. Dan, Carvanista, and Claire are all introduced well. There's even some genuinely great dialogue between the Doctor and Yaz. Finally, we get some proper banter between the main characters and some possible conflict. Yaz doesn't just stand around asking the Doctor what to do, she pushes back, argues slightly, she has actual agency. And by the time we reach the cliffhanger with all these dangling threads involving weeping angels, Sontarans, and some other potentially interesting characters, it's a great start to the season and I was excited to see where things would go. War of the Sontarans was a solid wee pseudo-historical, although the Doctor and companions did get separated again, which meant no more of that promising character development from the first episode, this was still an entertaining little adventure. The revamped design for the Sontarans is excellent, perfectly blending the classic Who design with the design seen in the Russell T. Davis era, and the production values in general were top-notch. The mystery of the Flux itself wasn't furthered all that much, but that's to be expected this early in the season. The Doctor knows the Sontarans aren't responsible, they're merely taking advantage of the situation, and she gets some possible clues for where to look next. Thus far I felt confident in my own assertion that serialising Doctor Who would help Chibnall showcase his strengths, it seemed right on the money. But then, Once Upon Time happened. This was the episode where I straight up had no fucking clue what the hell was happening. Well, to clarify, I understood the broad strokes of the plot, but so much crucial information here is left either totally vague or not included at all. We go to the planet Time, where the Ravagers are trying to unleash the Time Force, and to stop them, the Doctor and companions jump into a Time Storm and start having Time Slips, and the Ravagers are fighting in a war between Time and Space, and wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, what is supposed to be happening here? You can't just throw the word Time in front of other words and have it mean something. What is the Time Force, and why would unleashing it be bad? What is a Time Storm, and is it different to a Time Slip? I understood the characters were jumping into various timelines, alternate and otherwise, like that Farscape episode, but why do they keep seeing each other playing different people in their own timelines? The Ravagers were initially interesting with a memorable design, but this episode basically cemented they have nothing to do with the Flux, and their own evil plan, as far as I'm concerned, is completely incomprehensible. The Flux was already destroying the entire universe, but now we have these two trying to unleash the Time Force, which again, what is that? It feels like the idea for a totally different apocalyptic story concept which has been forcibly wedged into the Flux plotline. I was just baffled by the end. Thankfully, Village of the Angels seemed to get things back on track. I think most fans agree the Weeping Angels have yet to be topped from their first episode, and honestly, as iconic as they are, they probably shouldn't have returned for more episodes after Blink. But to my surprise, the Weeping Angels were pretty damn good in this episode. Not on par with their first appearance, but they still felt genuinely threatening, and the ongoing siege made us wonder how in the hell the Doctor was actually going to get out of this alive. Meanwhile, Yaz and Dan being trapped in an older version of the village, seemingly floating in space, was a brilliant image. It really reminded me of that dark fairy tale style of sci-fi Stephen Moffat often excelled at during his reign as showrunner. But finally after this we get to Survivors of the Flux, and this is where that almost brilliant in the title of this video comes from. At last we learn who created the Flux and why, and if the Doctor can stop it. The Doctor re-encounters Tecteun in a new regeneration who reveals herself to be the head of Division and creator of the Flux. The verbal sparring between the two is excellent, and performances are top-notch. I should say this is easily Jodie Whittaker's best season in terms of her inhabiting the role of the Doctor. She's still delightfully quirky, but the Doctor has been pushed further this time around, and Whittaker handles the shift to a slightly grittier 
and more desperate Doctor beautifully. To break this down so we're all on the same page here, Division created the Flux because of the Doctor. Knowing how powerful a rogue Time Lord can be, and how the Doctor has a habit of combating evil and inciting rebellion, etc., the Doctor's actions threaten to wrest the universe itself away from the iron grip control of Division. So they've decided, if they can't have the universe, no one can. It's the perfect distillation of this kind of abusive mother-daughter type relationship between Tech Tayun and the Doctor. But then there's the flip side. The Doctor can stop the Flux, reclaim her lost memories, and save the universe, but only if she gives up her free will and rejoins Division. This choice is brilliant. Either option packs in so much potential for high concept thrills and rich character development. Let's really examine this for a moment. Option 1. The Doctor rejects the offer, coming to terms with never getting her memories back and instead chooses to embrace who she is in the present and races to find another way to stop the Flux and take down Division. It's the ideal conclusion to the Doctor's character arc ever since we learned of this twist and ratchets up the stakes even more. But if the Doctor can't find a way to stop the Flux in time, she will have essentially doomed the universe to destruction because she wanted to keep her freedom, making her essentially responsible for the end of the universe itself. Not only does this option make the immediate plot all the more exciting and tense, but it also ties the development of the characters and their relationships directly to stopping the flux. Any progress made or obstacles encountered would have real consequences on a universe-wide and personal scale at the same time. But what about option two? The Doctor takes the offer, sacrificing her own way of life for the good of the universe. Yes, the Flux would be stopped, but the Doctor would have to say goodbye to her closest friends, give up her freedom, and commit to working for an organization which basically stands against everything she stands for. This option flips the scope of the plot on its head. The universe-ending threat is dealt with, but the true climax of the story would be far more personal and introspective. Minor spoilers here for Eve of the Daleks, but the long-running fan desire to see a romance between Yaz and the Doctor has finally been confirmed in that story, and I bet good money the writers already wanted to do that for quite some time. So can you imagine how heartbreaking it would have been to see the Doctor have to say goodbye to Yaz in order to stop the Flux? Remember the end of Doomsday? Huh? Huh? Perhaps this could even set the stage for Yaz basically saying fuck this and spending the finale launching a mission to rescue the Doctor. Maybe using all the allies found along the way, perhaps even some enemies as they certainly don't want to be controlled by Division either. Wouldn't that be amazing? But then the Ravagers show up and ruin everything. Tech Taeyun is killed, the Doctor never gets to choose anything, and now the Ravagers are going to use the Flux to destroy the universe anyway. The show basically swapped out one potentially very interesting villain with an apocalyptic superweapon for some far less interesting and quite confusing villains with the same apocalyptic superweapon. Except apparently them using the Flux is somehow worse, but again, when your stakes are as high as the whole universe will end, you can't really escalate beyond that. And to be fair, the options presented to the Doctor still have their problems. Division, while all encompassing and terrifying in concept, just doesn't feel like much of a threat. We know they employ Weeping Angels as hit squads, and that's certainly bad, we can all agree, but the Weeping Angels were already established villains. We don't really see Division itself do anything especially evil, at least not anything worse than your standard monster or conspirator of the week. I feel like this could have been foreshadowed a lot better by taking a leaf out of some Pertwee-era master antics where seemingly unrelated evil plots were found to have been created by him. Introduce Division maybe as the puppet masters of Spyfall or Can You Hear Me, that kind of thing. That would make the prospect of the Doctor being forced to work with them really scary. For option two to work, we really need that strong relationship between Yaz and the Doctor and hints of their true feelings for each other. Again, the Dr. Rose thing, but we've only gotten flashes of their relationship so far, and Flux didn't help itself by having Yaz and the Doctor constantly being separated from one another when they should be developing as characters together. And finally, as mentioned before, the Doctor being haunted by her hidden past should have been a way bigger deal, so that when she is presented with this offer from Division, we understand what accepting or rejecting those lost memories really means to her, because even when she gets the memories back, 
she just drops them into the console, possibly to never be discussed again. The actual finale we got presents us with a lot of spectacle, but with none of the emotion. Once again, we're back to the companions just standing around while the Doctor breathlessly yells what to do at them. Division is virtually forgotten by the end, the Ravagers are defeated with ease, and the Grand Serpent, Vinder, and Bell really didn't need to be here at all. Hijacking the Sontaran's own plan to defeat them, the Daleks, and Cyberman, and absorbing the Flux using the passenger is clever enough, I suppose, but again, just doesn't carry much emotional weight. The final scene between Yaz and the Doctor gives us a glimpse of that missing emotional investment. Had this relationship been put at the forefront of the series instead of getting bogged down in superfluous side characters and unnecessary villains, Flux could have easily been an awesome season of Doctor Who. The pieces were there, they just didn't click into place. Instead, Doctor Who Flux ultimately collapses under its own weight, but for a moment there, it was almost brilliant. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members, where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.